everybody. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, pay my respect to the Kulin Nations, to Elders past and present. We are on Aboriginal land, always was and always will be. I'd like to welcome you here to the Wheeler Centre today. My name is Tristan Meacham and it's a great pleasure to be your host of this conversation. I'm an artist and together with Beck Reed, um, we are All the Queen's Men uh, and All the Queen's Men champion social equality. We celebrate diverse communities, communities of interest through creative actions, socially engaged frameworks, queer cultural practice and large public spectacles. Our work is an attempt to reframe politics within communities and perhaps society at large. Of late, my body of work is really uh, considers the role that art can play in enriching personal connections and addressing social isolation within the elderly LGBTI community particularly. This discussion, uh, entitled Coming Together, Rethinking Art and Citizenship, is presented in partnership with the wonderful Melbourne Fringe. And this year, the Fringe have curated a sensational program of work under the title of XS, creative works that place children at the center of action and exploration. Now, as part of the program, we're absolutely thrilled to welcome to Australia Hamburg-based performance artist and academic, Sibylla Peters, who is here in Melbourne as the Melbourne Fringe Artist in Residence. Sibylla is the founder of the Theatre of Research uh, in Germany, which is a theatre for transgender transgenerational public, publics where children, artists and community researchers and citizens of all ages meet to explore and change the world together. I want to go to there. <laughs> Sibylla is here to present um, Truth or Dare, a live art experience for both children and adults that will allow adults to question why we don't tell some truths and empower children to find their own. And I'm sure we'll find out a little bit more about that later. We are also joined by uh, research artist Tanya Kanas. Tanya is, an arts, is uh, the arts director of RISE Refugee and the a lecturer at the VCA in arts and community practice. She currently sits on the editorial board uh, at the International Pedagogy and Theatre of the Oppressed Academic Journal and most recently was appointed international guest curator at the International Community Arts Festival. You're also the residence, uh, resident writer at the Malthouse Theatre. Please welcome both our wonderful guests. <laughs> I'm sitting in the middle, so I'm a little bit nervous. So, um, but today's discussion really considers the role that art can play in reimagining our future and how art practice and creative methodology might lead the way in transforming democracy and engaging with community. No pressure, art. <laughs> so considering this um, conversation um, and the creative relationships, uh, of creative relationships and engagement, um, we will also acknowledge that the speakers are up the front and the audience is down uh, there and that sets up certain things. Uh, traditionally, um, the conversations are around 45 minutes here and then 15 minutes of Q&A, but to make things a little bit more equal, to smash the hierarchies, we'll probably do about 30 minutes of conversation and then 30 minutes of questions with everyone. So let's start with you, Sibylla. If you'd like to provide maybe a little bit of introduction to your artistic practice. Yeah, uh, I'd love to. I mean, I just heard that uh, Tristan called you, Tanya, a research artist. And I think that's something that we have in, in common. That was very much also a starting point for my practice. I mean, you, you just said that you finished a PhD recently. Um, when I did that, that's a while ago, I felt that after years in the library, uh, I wanted to find a way to do cultural research in a more applied way. Uh, my PhD that was around 2000 was about the way we construct time in, in society um, and how we use media to do that. And I, want my, I wanted to test my findings in, in uh, I don't know, in, in, in the everyday. And I felt that the best place to, to do that might be the primary school. 
I've, I, I didn't work with kids so much before, but I had the feeling that in a primary school is where we learn most about time, right? We learn to be on time. Uh, we learn that, that, that there's a break between work time and play time. And we, we also learn that we have to kind of do something now to do something later. So we sacrifice the present for the future. And, and so I went into primary schools and talked to children and they told me that actually. And then we came up with a way to change time in school. So so how can we change the system of time in school? What do we have to do? And, and we did that in a way that was using a lot of means from, from live art. And, and, that was, uh, and then um, we took the um, research results and put them together to, to have a stage show to invite all the kids into the theater and kind of play our results back to them. And they found themselves in center in, in the center of this research and they saw themselves on stage in the footage that we made and they were absolutely exhilarated about that. And I felt that was very was the very beginning of my practice as theater of, of research and it is very much about making research everybody's research because I felt that um, actually in cultural studies and, and in, in the university as I experienced it, but also very much in the arts as I experienced it, artists and scientists, researchers, very much sit on their privilege of doing research, you know. We do the research and then we show you the results, right? And um, and that is actually not helpful, not even for the research. The research is, is not, I mean, the research is in cultural studies is much better or in social science is just comes to much better and more interesting and more multi-layered results if you find ways to include all kinds of people into the research, especially those who are who can contribute to to the question because it's something that they they know about from their everyday lives, you know. And this is basically this is one very important thing that that I try to achieve with my um, artistic practice or my research practice to make research. Um, yeah, to democratize, uh, democratize research, really. That was is at the core in the beginning. Speaking of time, we haven't been able to establish our little time clock, so I have yeah. no idea of time. Um, but if you could give me a wave at about half an hour into the conversation, that would be fantastic. Ah, oh, it starts now. It hasn't, oh, oh, it has started. Beg your pardon. We just lost 12 Tanya minutes. as well, can you um, maybe give us a little bit of um, insight into time, yeah, the future it's and the time. present? <laughs> um, that was very scary. <laughs> well, it, was, it wasn't started. Uh, can you maybe can you give us a little bit of um, uh, insight into some of the communities of interest that you work with and, and, and your practice is, is, is concerned around? Yeah, and I'm going to answer that um, in relation to the question about research and, and theory. Um, so... I did an undergrad in uh, contemporary arts, so theatre um, and psychology, but what, what I ended up encountering in second year was theatre of the oppressed. And that was the first time throughout my high school interest in theatre, throughout my external curriculum interest in theatre, that I encountered a methodology and a form that spoke to the communities that I was part of and that I was interested in in talking and having a conversation with. Um, and in particular, that that form and that has a, has a very politicised history and it didn't shy away from it. So that's what really interested me. Um, and from that moment onwards, um, I was really interested in, in talking about how um, arts as a practice is research and starting to sort of um, do away with some of those borders, um, as I theorise about it, borders or hierarchies and structures that says this is an artist, this is a participant, mm. this is an audience, uh, and this is, you know, the researcher that translates what's going on. So talking about how do you get the researcher out of that translation role, which historically has been a power role, um, and start to sort of open up those roles and that platform um, across, a, you know, a across methodologies. Um, and so I really talk about um, practice as research. Um, and that as a methodology has really spoken to me. Um, and and what, why it also interested me is because even, you know, even applied theatre itself has a very particular pathologizing history. You know, we talk about 
I'm a theater artist and I will apply it to a community. Um, and having experienced theater being applied to me um, in a really violent way, I was like, whoa, like ugh, applied theater. And it's like, that's why practice as research and even, you know, historical forms like applied theater in the context of Melbourne, Australia, mm. colonial context, um, was problematic in and of itself. Um, and I, I think research has so much potential. There is so much amazing theories going on, women of color writing amazing things. Um, research has so much to it. It's so incredible, but it's not being, um, it's not being utilized in a form that applies to all. Um, and I'm gonna give you an example. Um, when I was very young in primary school, I used to walk my dog, um, his name was Tito, um, and he was a little chihuahua, Jack Russell, and he used to walk quite crooked, um, and he used to walk like this, so with his legs first and his neck going backwards. And I was like, oh, I think, I think he's walking like this because the leash is trying to hold his neck back, but he's so excited to be out that his body's going forward, and so he's walking in this particular way. And then my dad said to me, this was during the walk, he was like, what you did now was theorize. That's theory. And from that moment on, I was like, theory is us. Theory is everywhere. It's alive, it's breathing. It's been institutionalized out of our bodies and out of ourselves. And I, I talk about theory being used on us rather than us theorizing when it's become institutionalized. So did I answer your question? <laughs> and then some, absolutely. <laughs> uh, thinking of obviously the connection between both of your practices, yeah. which is obviously a, a reframing of the relationship with the mm. communities of interest that you work with and how those structures can be, um, how you can incorporate those into creative processes. I guess I'm really interested at the moment in the process of that art making um, and its application as well. Um, how do you establish these art processes and how are you working in this new collaboration with, with different communities? What's your methodology for co-authorship and creative agency? Mm. Um, I think most uh, projects in the theatre of research start um, by being fueled of something that I would like to call wish energy. So um, the children we work with, they have uh, certain wishes and they are very good in articulating them. I mean, I often find, I also often ask adults about their wishes, but it's basically always the same. It's kind of a bit boring. I, I don't know, it's a peace and, and health and all that. But, but never something like, I want to be a pirate or... Oh, or, 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 yeah, even I want to be rich is something that we don't dare to say anymore, <laughs> loud, loud. <anymore. laughs> I don't know. And so um, many of our projects really start with these, like, wishes, yeah. which we collect. And then some of these wishes just stay in our wish lists and wish collections. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it happens that we find a way to make or that we think we might have a chance to make a wish come true, maybe in a little bit weird way. Mm -hmm. Um, but that we find in discourse, and that's kind of a triangle. We have the wish energy here. Then we have uh, another part of the another point of the triangle is uh, discourse or cultural studies with, or psych, uh, social studies, which is the background of many of our uh, adult collaborators mm -hmm. in a way. And and then of course also the means of art and the resources of the theater. How can we bring them together in a way to kind of make surprisingly a wish come true or push it towards the real right mm -hmm. so for example with this wish uh, this wish i want to be rich hey many children have these this wish and i was for a while i was really kind of annoyed by that because you know i mean if it's about magic or uh, i mean we can do something right but if it's about money we don't have money either in cultural production mm -hmm. for kids you know so i didn't know what to do but um we found then people who were experts in creating community currencies mm -hmm. actually people from brazil who uh, um, made their own currency community-based currency and then we made a community-based currency in our theater that's called the children's bank of Hamburg, where we then have shareholder meetings of all the of, of the kids, and 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 then 
also the shop owners. So it's a real network that we build where, where kids can then make their own money, like design their own money. It's called adventure money, but then can really also go and, and spend the money in the network of shops and services that that, that we find to cooperate with, uh, with us on this project. And we all learn a lot about money. It was this project originated in the in, in the high time of the financial crisis and it, it, what I find, found interesting about it was that uh, I felt we empowered each other you know not only we empowered the children now to have their community currency but the children also empowered us to think uh, in a new way together with our neighbors with this network of shops and that we built we it empowered uh, the children empowered us back to be able to think about money and how money should be designed to help communities instead of training them so mm. that's just one example yeah. Yeah. but it all it has to be a wish mm. in the beginning mm. but otherwise it doesn't work curiosity is totally overestimated mm. <laughs> and tanya your ideas of co-authorship how, how are you um instigating that in your creative practice yeah i think the one of the most important things to take into consideration is um not just what the platform is and how a voice might exist within a platform. Because the way we talk about it at Rise is, is there might be a platform for a voice to exist for a momentary time, um, but that doesn't mean that that platform has come about through autonomous self-determining processes. So if anything, it might be a very tokenistic or um, an extension of a pathologizing ideology process, right? So what we talk about is, you know, control of the full means of creative production. Um, and, and if you want to talk about it, outcomes as well, because often what happens is, you know, um, there might be a space for a particular co collaboration, but then that gets translated for certain institutes um, and, and certain reports. So what we look at is like, how do you open up platforms? How do you create controls of platforms as an ongoing process? Um, and so we conceptualise it as a, as a multi-entry multi, um, point model. Um, and that, you know, from a personal practice point of view, I think one way we can conceptualise it is um, there's, there's a methodology called um, caminando preguntando. You walk, you ask questions. You walk, you ask questions. And that means it's a long process and it's a time-consuming process and it requires a lot of resources, not just financial, but time and effort, a lot of emotional labour as well because we're talking about generational trauma, we're talking about violence and embodied trauma as well in an ongoing sense. Um, so it's very much about, you know, talking. You know, a process can be reading as well having a conversation with your elders, like this is how we open up the, the idea of what is a process. It could be breathing and living. It's moving in the world, right? Mm. That, yeah, that's a bigger pattern. Yeah, uh, I would like to, to, uh, to say something about that. I think it was also very important. Would you agree, Tanya, to, to differentiate if you, are, if you are in a project with people who want to do art, Right? Who want, or or if you are collaborating on a different level, if you kind of put art to the use of something mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. that participants might have in mind to achieve, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I think that's very important to differentiate because you are totally right that we see we have a, a long discussion now, like about a decade, about the critique of participation, mm -hmm. and it's a very important discussion. Because because very often, you know, it's uh, it's some kind of, it might not look bad, but it's some kind of exploitation mm -hmm. going on mm -hmm. that you have an, a director, for example, and the name of the director gets uh, famous and travels around the world and the names of all the participants mm -hmm. who are in the, in the play doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so f just to give a small example, but I think it's important, I mean... 
there are different kinds of participation. You can also do something that only for the director or the team of artists that is kind of hosting a situation or a project is supposed to be art mm -hmm. for for the participants included. It might be something mm -hmm. that is much more about activism mm -hmm. or about achieving mm -hmm. a very distinct, specific goal, right? Or not even knowing what the reason is as well. In terms of the practice that I'm engaged with, it's really about how do you start a conversation with a community? How do you even build a community? How do you connect with people when the idea of uh, the, the privileges that we have um, aren't part of their communities as well? Um, I, I, I would add to that and say that um, there are communities that are um, politicised, whether it's self-politicised or whether it's... Um, categorized as a particular social political identity um, and that need that is carried um, in an ongoing sense almost whether you like it or not so I think in the context of the, the work that I do so with refugee asylum seekers and ex-detainees it's always activism and there's there's no way about it it's always going to be activism Thinking about that, because I'm also aware of that, that balance, my work now feels like it's moving more into a social space um, in terms of, um, I guess, a broader conversation around my interest within um, the LGBTI space as well. How important for you both is outcomes then as art makers or as collaborators? Is that of, is that an interest at all? Of course, I mean, <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Maybe I'm not aware of all the different implications of the word outcome mm -hmm. in English. But of course, I mean, um, but I would say, I mean, good projects have often a lot of outcomes. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can, I can put it yeah, that yeah, way. Yeah. And it is very important to kind of be, also if you plan a process like, that you have... A, like a journey with different outcomes. Mm -hmm. And often, if you work in a project with heterogeneous partners, there might be an outcome for each of these groups, mm -hmm. right? You know, there might be an outcome in a school, there might be an outcome at a researcher's conference at the university, mm -hmm. there might be an outcome then in our theatre. Mm -hmm. And it, I think the best projects are those which have these multi-layered outcomes mm -hmm. where every, that kind of, of course, also link to each other mm -hmm. and are not totally um, distinct, but yeah, yeah, I think that's important. And also those, those outcomes might not even be detectable to a dominant ideology or a consciousness, and that's fine. Mm. It doesn't mean they're not mm. happening. Mm. And sometimes you don't have to share those outcomes um, in these spaces. You can, you know, I talk about refusal methodology. Some spaces don't deserve to hear certain things, don't need to hear certain things, because I'm talking about a power relation here. Um, and I think that's a really important part of RISE's process as well, because we talk about um, work within community. So RISE is the first um, organisation to be run, governed um, by refugee asylum seekers and ex detainee communities. Um, so we work very much within um, mm. grassroots and often we find that, yeah, certain spaces don't deserve to hear certain things. Um, interestingly, in your collaborations with people outside of the arts, um, have you ever come across um, someone that you've worked with that has opposing views to yourself? Um, and as an artist, how, how have you worked um, with these people, perhaps outside your political ideologies or points, to uh, create something in an inclusive and open way? Well, first I have to say that's the whole fun of it, right? I mm. mean, obviously you, you meet in this kind of work, you meet people of all kinds of backgrounds mm. and maybe even political opinions mm. and so on. Um, of course, the fun ends pretty quickly when yeah. when, when certain lines are crossed, mm. you know, and then, I mean, I think that's the same for, for all of us. I mean, I'm, I'm still angry at myself. Last week we had the... We had um, one of we we often found strange institutions institutions which are somehow between fiction and reality and one of that is the ghost insurance where schools can get an insurance account against being haunted 
and then if they are kind of haunted, then we come to the school and we do something that is a psychogeographical mapping of the school where children can express how they feel in certain spaces of their school and we can can find certain conflicts which are there. But last week I worked with and with the school and tried to find the, do those that mapping and the teacher came up to me and said, okay, this is the group you are working with today. Um, challenging kids are this, 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 and the black one over there, right? I mean, <laughs> like in front of them, mm. and I still, I still don't have the, don't, don't have the right response to that, really. I mean, I may, I talked to the kids then about it and when we started working. I mean, how they feel about it, and so. And then the the teacher and the whole school is now coming. When I come back to Hamburg, they are coming to the theater where we have a séance. Uh, I mean, we found those ghosts, right? And and then we will in the theater we will have a kind of séance with them and talk about conflicts and things that happen in school. And then I I will I will get back at her. I, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I would like to start off with a bit of a par paraphrasing of um, a Caribbean uh, writer and academic and she talks about how colonialism has incorporated people into the same site um, of representation and interpretation but not equally. So we're all incorporated into this site whether we like it or not but this is not um, an equal process. So within that process, categorization, power dynamic structures sort of begin to play out. Um, so when we talk about inclusive and open way, mm -hmm. I kind of like to challenge that and say, if you are talking about an equal arrow happening between inclusion, dialogue and trans um, um, transparency, what's actually happening is something unequal mm -hmm. because we already exist in an unequal site of exchange. Mm. So I have um, um, a, a problem when theatre really falls back on the, the um, unproblem, um, uncritiqued dialogue of inclusion, mm. dialogue and transparency because I see how these very terms are used um, for the very opposite reason, right? Um, so I, I talk about theatre as an as an organising principle, as a, as a way to communicate within community and you know, I'm aware that there are other organisations that kind of do the bridging-based work, that maybe they have more resources, time, that's part of their values, but within RISE, it's from the community up. Um, and that's the first organisation to do that. And I kind of really refer to um, Biko's work a lot when he talks about, um, you know, if you're talking about a, a table and wanting to be invited to the, t the, to the table, it's still a table, it's still a chair. So it's like, how can we really use theatre um, and the arts to rethink sitting at a table, even? Um, and, you know, I, I, was, I was recently invited to sort of hold a space to talk about how to create more um, diversity in the arts, right? And my suggestion um, to this particular company was that the meetings needed to be closed. If it was people of colour, First Nations identifying peoples, it needs to be a closed meeting. Um, and that was refused on the basis of transparency and dialogue. So the very terms are very restrictive, mm. used in a very restrictive way in, in, in a creative Great process, point. yeah. So inclusion, mm, mm. I'd like to shift that mm. a little bit more, yeah. Absolutely. Before we throw um, some questions out to the audience, um, I guess I just wanted you to reflect on one moment recently that you've had working with people that um, has provided you with a moment of hope, I guess a moment of warmth, um, restoring your faith in uh, the, the everyday. Um, is there a moment that you can talk about recently that you've celebrated in a creative context? Now let me think about that for a moment. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy it very much. Um, I was just thinking, what particular moment was it? But um, I'm enjoying very much to be here in Melbourne and work on a new um, on a new piece um, for Melbourne Fringe that will be um, shown, or first the first tryout will be next weekend at the uh, Northcote Town Hall, and we are going to play a game of truth or dare. 
and it will be truth for their kids versus adults. So I've spent the whole week um, going um, to schools uh, around Melbourne and talk to kids about what they would like adults to be honest about. And so that they and, and invite them to have uh, to ask these questions and tell them that we will do our best to bring adults to the stand for them to answer these questions then honestly. And then of course also what they want adults to do, which is the dare <laughs> part of it, right? <laughs> Um, but it's also the other way around. So we had a workshop uh, at this this weekend, uh, where then adults also get the chance to to raise their questions uh, for kids um, and and things that they would uh, a kid uh, would want a kid to do. And so it will be. A, a, Let's see if Truth or Dare played publicly and uh, transgenerationally can create um, an interesting situation at North Coast Town Hall where kids and adults are e in an equal starting position. And um, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to that one. Um, okay, so one moment, let, let me rephrase that. So my research is on, on refugee theatre and that's what my... Um, the, the research degree was on, the PhD was on. Um, and the leaders of refugee theatre um, are not those with lived experience. Um, and every time I would read a book about applied theatre or working with the disadvantage of our, com our community, um, it w the, the phrasing was very much positioning um, uh, as if it, the, there was some inherent privilege about doing this kind of work. It, pri it privileged cis males um, of at least middle class um, standing or above. And just the language was so... Um, I, I found it to be really violent um, to say, oh, let's, you know... Of, of course, we're, we're writing from a <laughs> position of privilege and, of course, the reader here is of a particular social standing, so let's talk about how to work with community. So it required a lot of double reading um, and having to you know, sorry, un unpack a lot of that language to even, you know, begin to unpack the ideology. So one of, I guess, one of the little wins um, was when uh, I was writing a, a book chapter for a, a publication around refugee theatre and I used we, but I positioned we as a community we. And, you know, the, the response by the editor was, well, you're just, you're assuming that the reader is of refugee background and I was like well you're assuming they're not and so that's what the, there's little wins there's always those little wins where you can find a side of resistance so you know that looks different for different positionalities and and for me and and from when I had these conversations at Rise saying we in the context of a published um, book chapter about refugee theatre was huge because it wasn't just a singular we. Um, we'd now like to open up to the audience for any questions. We have a few mics coming down. Um, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? Yeah. Thanks. I, I should stand. <laughs> um, I was asked to help with a play that was about refugees a number of years ago, and I spent uh, about a year uh, in the detention center with the various people there and talking with them. And the problem I found there was that um, they couldn't say yes and they couldn't say no. They couldn't say yes, tell my story, or no, tell my story, because they were in such serious danger. Right? They didn't want to be endangered by my presence there because if they said no and I got upset, maybe that would cause problems for them. But if they said yes and I went there and put the play out, the government had already uh, sent some people back to their countries for being recognized in some of these works. And uh, that concerned me and upset me and I went and spoke with the theater that was, had commissioned me and said, hang on, do we have anybody from the refugee community consulting on this, either as a director or as actors or as anybody, you know, someone from the, the, um, the um, 
Australian uh, Refugee Resource Center. I've got the wrong name there, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and they had nobody, absolutely nobody. I pulled out and they found someone else to quickly write something and just put it up. And I just shredded my heart to bits because I thought it was wrong. And I don't know what you think of that sort of, of approach to, to um, telling refugee stories, but I would appreciate hearing from you. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my, um, my research was on something I called performing credibility. So uh, when you are labelled a refugee, you have to uh, perform a credibility towards, yes, I am a refugee, that's also a bureaucratic type performance. Um, but then that, that becomes an ongoing performance when refugee becomes, um, when refugee exists within a colonial context. So that becomes, uh, you know, the same question of are you a refugee becomes where you're from, becomes are you qualified to be here? It's same question in different iterations. So what I'm saying this for is, is <clears throat> the need to be able to identify the, a particular type of refugee manifestation. And often that is in a um, detention centre environment. Often that is in a very welfareistic-based approach of a very um, materialistically dependent time of a person's life. I talk about refugee as not just the point of view of, you know, a government saying, oh, now you're, now you're an Australian citizen, so you're no longer a refugee. I talk about it as a, a politicised lived experience that is ongoing outside of a colonial frame of citizenship. So I talk about refugee-ness. And within refugee-ness, there is agency. There's ways to find sites of resistance. But when it comes to finding certain stories from sites of privilege, um, often the seeking for certain stories comes at the point of pain narrative, right? And that's, you know, it's, it's a particular manifestation. And if you do not present as that, you are not seen as victim enough or as refugee enough. So I would even say that, you know, a conceptualization of detention center is one way of looking at refugee as a manifestation. And actually, there are so many different ways. And I think that's the problem with um, arts practices wanting to work with refugees and even NGOs who have done some unethical work um, who want to work with refugees. It is a very simplistic, narrow-minded demand of a certain performativity, whether it's to be human, refugee, you know, um, that actually entraps that person into that and it doesn't see the multiplicity of what it can look like. And I think, you know, yes, I, I understand the politicised nature of detention centres. I understand that's a very, very overt manifestation of violence. But I have the problem when that is the only form of approaching um, or the only way to identify refugee mm. and... Ref yeah, mm. yeah. Please, please. Can I? Please, absolutely. Okay. Um, there's a part of my practice which is not so much working with children. It's uh, more activist work that I do with adults and it's uh, under a name uh, called of a group called Geheimagentur, which is secret agency, which is called secret agency because we don't use our artist names when we do this work for to to get out of a few of the participation traps in a way um, and in this work i do a project with 10 former refugees from gambia ghana and nigeria who live in in hamburg in my neighborhood and who, who i got to know in the park basically and um, i think uh, what i what we achieved together those 10 men and me and a few other people was that we just asked what they would like to do or get done and that had nothing to do with art but they want to do is to send stuff to Gambia so they want to collect stuff that is available in Europe like and then put it in a container and send that to Gambia and basically we that's what we are doing now for two years 
And we, uh, I mean, the people who are artists in it are strangely able. I don't know really how this works, but somehow we send these, these uh, the, the um, people from Gambia send the stuff uh, to Gambia in, in the container. So the second one will be sent in about a week. And um, we use art money to make that happen, right? So we are not creating art, but we, in a way we do. Right? Because we make an exhibition out of it, out of we make uh, research into logistics mm -hmm. out of it, into um, how things travel and how mm -hmm. people travel and how the traveling of things is enhanced and mm -hmm. um, the traveling of people is hindered. Um, but what the outcome for them is the container that goes to Gambia mm -hmm. and not standing on a stage telling a story. Yeah. And I think an important point you make is for who? Mm. And that's a really important question because if we're, you know, I, I also problematize the idea of raising consciousness about a particular issue because it's like whose consciousness are you raising, first of all, and whose bodies are you using to raise that particular consciousness that probably could find a really good article to read mm. or some good books to read and really start to do that thinking without having to use bodies that have to carry that experience and throw them on stage. Mm. Is there any other questions from the audience? Hi. Um, hi. hi. I, w I would like to talk to Tanya about this one. Um, you were talking about oh. inclusion and diversity <laughs> and, um, you know, the use of language to describe, um, you know, all these issues. I often use, you know, diversity and inclusiv inclusivity in my work and nevertheless I find that you know like who I'm serving I'm do I I'm serving myself or I'm serving you know like sort of a, a the status quo nevertheless these words are very important to be used because I want to be included you know I want diversity so my question is what sort of language can we use to address these issues that you know they're not so loaded yeah, um, I think, you know, language is a moving, changing thing. And, like, yeah, it, it comes with assumptions. It comes with a very particular history. Um, but there's also reclaiming of words as well. Like, if we look at um, Chicanismo, for example, initially used in one way, now used in a very politicised, pro-empowerment way. Um, and I think that's a process in and of itself. And I think what I try to do in my work and my writing is to try to highlight some of the um, assumptions of the language. So whether that means reframing it, whether that means another definition or a new word altogether, I don't know. But to inherently say that, you know, change, let's let's interrogate change. Let's interrogate what inclusion means. Let's interrogate what exchange means, which is because it's often thrown around, thrown around without a second thought at, at the expense of the communities it's supposed to be serving, right? So, I'm going to give you a specific example. I'm not sure if this helps, but um, so uh, a graduate program at the VCA wanted to come and see the work that RISE was doing. Um, RISE is based at Ross House, um, and it is we consider it a safe space. Having these students come into the space would have jeopardised that safe space. So instead of RISE saying a straight up, "No, we're not going to talk to you. Go away." Um, we invited the students and, and hosted them at the basement of Ross House, which is kind of like the foyer area. And we held the lecture there. We ended up having a half an hour conversation about why we were actually having the conversation in the basement as opposed to Rise. And that actually got us to a much more interesting space and conversation than it would have if we were like, yes, come into Rise. This is the library. This is a person over there on the computer. This is like... That conversation would have taken, you know, if at all, an hour to have if we had invited the students into the space. So in addition to reframing language or challenging language, it's the reframing of having a conversation. So by us having a half an hour conversation about representation um, and about safe space, um, we actually got students thinking a lot more critically about what they carry into a space aesthetically, social positionality, and how that jeopardises a potentially safe space. But also the assumption that one can just walk into everywhere, which is a 
it's a huge privilege in and of itself. So I, that's, that's a refusal methodology, which is not just a straight up saying no. It's a no, let's have a conversation about why it's no. Hi, um, I was very interested, I'm interested in gatekeepers. Um, like where your point, Sibylla, when you're talking about the teacher who, you know, interpreted the class for you before you started working with them. That idea of people who are in power, who are interpreting or mediating with the power of others. Um, I'd be very interested to hear your opinions on how you, what's the conversation you have with gatekeepers in the, your various works? How do you bring them with you or how do you challenge their power when you're talking about their relationship with people who don't have that power? I mean, that's always also relative, right? I mean, I'm a gatekeeper in, in a certain institution, right? I'm a gatekeeper of my theatre in, in a way. There are many young artists who want to perform and can't, so I, I'm the bad guy then. And, and um, that happens in all kinds of institutions. And I think how we, how we deal with that is to not kind of push gatekeepers out, but acknowledge that they are gatekeepers and that they have certain responsibilities and that they also then are confronted with other gatekeepers, you know. And I think we also try to... Um, mix it up a bit. I mean, we try to acknowledge, for example, we do then workshops with teachers, right, for a special project and address address these things then. But um, often we also kind of um, mix the game up by, by creating an institution that nobody can uh, immediately... Um, I mean, if you have an institution like the Society for the Invention of Measuring Devices... Right, that is kind of addressing your school and tell uh, that uh, maybe it becomes a bit difficult. We try to kind of uh, create some kind of confusion around the gates mm -hmm. and the different institutions, and we try to be, uh, we, we try to bring um, uh, fun and and also some form of, of of spy technique, I would say, into into the whole institutional game. Um, yeah. So uh, Rise runs a foreign theatre workshop process every year with um, the MX students at Melbourne Polytechnic, used to be NMIT. Um, and we have written in that contract when we approach the institution that the teacher needs to be involved in the introductory games at least. And it's one of the hardest things to get teachers to be involved in that because of a very specific power dynamic. Uh, and, you know, something like that to, you know, theatre games are the fastest way to democratise a room. And that's a quote from Hector Artisival, a mentor in Theatre of the Oppressed. And, you know, it's about shifting up that space, shifting up, you know, students' idea of what's wrong, what's right, what's correct. Um, and, and bring in the play again. So often we do that through theatre games when we, um, like when we use a particular theatre methodology. Um, but in saying that, I, I would also, I am, I'm an optimist, um, but I would also say that in certain, in certain positions, and I'm talking um, as, a, as a RISE member and I'm talking as a person um, who identifies as a woman of colour, Sometimes you have to choose between, and I quote, this is um, Genevieve Greaves here, you have to choose between um, being a warrior and being a peacemaker. And, you know, both of those are highly politicised, but when you're in certain situations, sometimes it's about um, understanding when a site can be a site of resistance and when sometimes you have to rest for self-care and fight the next battle. We've got time for one more question from the audience. I hope you can see me. This is really for Sir Walt. Um, <coughs> sorry about my voice here. Um, very curious about um, your Truth or Dare um, program that's coming up. And um, I'm, I'm not 
I'm, I usually don't ask a question like this, but I'm going to ask it. Um, so I, I, I'm from North Asia, and I live in Singapore. And uh, so this is my second week in Australia. Um, one of the things I've noticed is this constant mention of elders. In fact, all your programs start with almost an opening. There's a protocol here that, that I wasn't aware of, you know, mm -hmm. the respect for elders. So in your truth or dare, um, you obviously have adults and you have children. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it could easily turn into a kind of name and shame and, and make fun of the adults. Um, how do you manage a sensitivity like that, or do you? Or is it, is it just considered a fun thing to do and that the adults will take it all well? Because if I were a child, I would say, what, what is all this respect for elders? And yet, you know, I have this opportunity to really um, make fun and, and have a great time at their expense. <laughs> so I'm, I'm from North Asia. I know all about elders. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a very, very good question and goes into the heart of the production process that we are in right now. I mean, obviously, I always love truth. I always love truth or dare as a game, because it's about the two things I I care most for, like truth and dare. I mean, what can there be better in in one game? Yeah, I mean, courage and truth. But um, of course it's played, I mean, I often felt when I was small that it's not quite living up to its potential because it's used so much to embarrass people or, or make fun of people. But I've, I still feel that, that it's, it's in, at the very core of my practice are these two things, you know, to bring each other into a situation where it's possible to answer truthfully to each other's questions and um, to train to be more courageous, you know, and we need to do both, and both are also essential for for public space or for creating a public that uh, that we need, you know. I mean, that's at the very core. That was a very starting question about democracies. I think that um, we really need training, and that's one very important thing also that art does, apart from research, is training and truthfulness and, and courage. Mm -hmm to be able to, you, to, to, I don't know, to foster a public space that we might need, you know, if things really get hard, we need a public space to gather there, to assemble, to find out what's true and to find out what we have to have the courage to do now, you know, and that's um, somehow what we, are, what we are training at the North Coast Town Hall. And I try to make, a, a, I try to invite the children to, um, to see it like I do, <laughs> but um, they don't all do that, I have to say. <laughs> but so, um, <laughs> which is fine, you know. It's also very important for me because it's. All, uh, Tanya said that also. It's very important for me to hand over means of production in a way, and that's with working with kids is often not not quite easy because obviously the means of production that we as adults have to handle are you cannot just put it on a child, you know, okay, this is, you have now to cope with the budget of several thousand and you, you do this now, you know, so you have to find a way to, to break down the means of production in a way that is actually doable for a kid. And that is very much, a, to, that can very much be achieved with truth or dare because they know it and they know they can answer, ask a question or they can give an instruction and then it's going to happen. And I didn't want to be the 30th person that day who said, you have to be good, you know. So yeah, there are a few um, dares which are a bit um, like about eating a bug or something. But most of them are really about... Um, I mean, questions like why, why do uh, women and men, boys and girls, have to use different bathrooms? Why, um, why is there gravity? Um, why does the earth have different colors? Why are some people so rude to their small children? Why? <laughs> You know, I think, I mean, if you come to North Coast Town Hall, and I would really invite you to, uh, would really be happy if you do, uh, go for the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Can I add something please, quickly? Please. Um, I'm just going to be very quick because I'm conscious of the time. Um, so, uh, refugee and asylum seekers 
uh, subject to uh, white Australia and uh, pressured to perform white Australia and become an extension of white Australia at the expense of First Nations peoples. So when we talk about elders at RISE, it's not just an age thing, it's a, it's a respect to First Nations peoples here and, and an alliance with self-determination with First Nations peoples here as opposed to a colonial understanding of that. Um, so it's not just the age and generational thing, it is how this is an ongoing struggle and we are here for a very particular time and place in history, but we have to acknowledge the, the work and the sacrifice that's happened before us. On behalf of the Wheeler Centre and the Melbourne Fringe, I'd really like to thank Tanya Kanas and Sibylla Peters. Please give them a big round of applause. Thank you. And for you also, right? Yeah. Thanks very much. Have a great night. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world. <laughs>